Did everybody get a copy of the notes? All right. So let's begin with a couple of announcements. I think everybody gave me their homework assignments. And um, so I'll take a look at those and try and get the scores posted tomorrow or Friday on uh, MU Online. And then I'll return them to you next week. Um, Next week, we're going to have the class presentations. And the way we're going to work that is that you should be prepared to speak for 10 minutes. And uh, if you speak less than that, I think um, you, know, you won't get full credit necessarily. I, there's definitely enough material to be covered um, for beyond 10 minutes. So you can use your textbook as a resource. And there are a lot of other good references online where you don't even really have to do too much work to find good pictures about a sedimentation basin or whatever your uh, topic is assigned. So give pictures, uh, just an explanation of how it works, why it's important, what the objective is. Uh, I think I gave you all the details you need on the handout from last week. If you are going to use PowerPoint, and I imagine that many of you will, then bring your file with you on a flash drive. That'll be a lot easier than having to log on to like webmail and get the file off that way. It's just the quick, quickest way for us to get lots of people on and off the computers quickly. And um, I emphasize that it's worth 5% of your course grade not just to make it seem too stressful or raise the stakes higher than they ought to be, but just to let you know that you know it's a, a substantial opportunity for you to get a good chunk of your final grade in just one blast. So any questions about the announcements here before we move on to this evening's lecture? All right. I did want to mention one thing about uh, submitting homework. I got a good question today about, you know, how do you submit an Excel spreadsheet in a way that allows me, the grader, to understand what you did? You know, sometimes in Excel, it's just numbers without really being able to see your work in the same way that a written solution would be. So I encourage you to use Excel any chance you can, because it really will automate your calculations and um, make things easier. But I want to give you partial credit. And occasionally, students make mistakes. It's just, uh, it happens. I make mistakes too. And so if you want partial credit, then you have to show your work so that I can understand what you did right and differentiate that from where you may have gone awry. Um, so here's just an illustration of how you can uh, show your work and also use Excel at the same time. And I wanted to identify a couple of key characteristics. And maybe you'd want to write them in the margin of the notes that I've given you. Some of the things that when you submit Excel work, um, how I can see what you did. And one of them is that you should maybe briefly identify what is the question, you know, question number or a brief restatement of the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, another thing is that when you're setting up a spreadsheet, you don't necessarily have to um, add cells that identify the variables. You know, When I do the calculations, all I'm going to refer to is this cell where 0.3 is and where 40 is. All of this over here on the left where I've identified the variable and listed the units, that doesn't have anything to do with the calculations, but it's just more understanding the solution when it's printed out. So what I'd encourage you to do, another one of the bullet points of something to do, is uh, identify what's in these cells. So you can see I've listed the variable and then also the units. Now, you don't have to format each exponent necessarily. You know, I'm not expecting it to be beautiful. But um, having the units there will help you to avoid mistakes if maybe you know, you're trying to multiply liters per second by a cross-sectional area of square meters. And, suddenly you'll realize, oh, well, the units aren't matching up yet. Because you know, if you list the units, you can avoid mistakes. So that's another characteristic. Um, so you can insert formulas. And that'll really help me to see, you know, how is this D calculated? Well, it's that you have this formula here. And so I can go through with my calculator and just do a quick calculation of you know, using the variables that were identified above and the equation that you used. So you're kind of showing like the flow of your solution. You can see here that uh, the steps of what was done are numbered here. And it's an iter this particular problem is an iterative solution that I take from my hydraulics class. 
and so iteration one, iteration two, iteration three, and so on. Um, but basically what it's showing is just the flow of the work. And uh, of course, if I have any detailed questions, I may email you and ask you to send me your spreadsheet. But that can get really time consuming when there's a lot of students in a class to look through every cell of every spreadsheet trying to figure out what was done. And it's just a lot easier if you kind of document the workflow. And this is a good idea just in professional practice as well to make your spreadsheets as easy uh, for other people to understand because ultimately you'll come back to a spreadsheet and even though you maybe put this together for a professor or for someone else who at the time can't see what seems so obvious to you, I've come back to spreadsheets a year later and totally forgotten how to use it or what went where. And if you put these sort of uh, signposts and indicators to yourself back when you're creating it, it's so much easier to pick it up again. So it's just kind of like a good practice to uh, make it more readily absorbable. So that's what I'd suggest you try and do when you're submitting your Excel work and just, you know, taking a quick glance through what you submitted today. It looks like everybody basically did that naturally anyhow. So I don't think we'll have any trouble. So the bottom line is just uh, document the method that you used and try and show your work as much as possible. Um, last week we did a calculation example that uses a flow equalization basin. And we were covering material from chapter two last week, and now we're in chapter three for this week's lecture. Uh, but this figure is in chapter three, so I thought I'd just bring it up since it relates to what we covered last time and point out a couple of uh, interesting features of the flow equalization basin. Um, in this case, they're showing the flow equalization basin as trapezoidal in shape and configuration rather than you know, cylindrical, which is what I think we had assumed when we were doing our um, estimate in class. It doesn't, the, the shape of it doesn't necessarily matter too much. One thing that is important, though, um, is what they're calling freeboard here. And you design the depth of the flow equalization basin so that on the peak day of the year when you've got the most flow coming into the um, wastewater treatment plant, on the peak day of the year at the end of the design life when you've got lots of population and you've got as much flow coming in as you can expect, you still want to have a little bit of extra height above the liquid surface. That freeboard is to prevent uh, if they're splashing or wind or waves, you don't want it sloshing all over outside of the aeration basin, especially in the case of um, wastewater like this that hasn't really been treated yet. Um, another important feature of a flow equalization basin is that there needs to be an aerator inside the flow equalization basin because this is raw, untreated wastewater and it's going to have a lot of BOD in it. And so, you know, you're storing this waste before you put it into the main treatment system, but even though it's sort of on pause and it hasn't entered the treatment train yet, it's still going to be consuming oxygen. And so if you don't supply oxygen and it goes anaerobic, then it can get really nasty and um, one of the gases that can come off of anaerobic uh, waste is hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic and poisonous and corrosive. So that's definitely to be avoided. Um, so those are a couple of features, and we'll get into more details about the geometry of different features in the uh, treatment train. But since we talked about it last week, I thought I'd show you that image. Now, I'm going to be going through a lot of figures and tables that are from Chapter 3. Um, who's still waiting on the textbook? So everybody in here has got their textbook? All right, good. Um, any of the things that, you know, on the page maybe are printed out too small to see in a lot of detail? I think some of these tables are going to be maybe a bit hard to read. Um, the full size tables are in your text. It's just all taken out of chapter three for tonight. Basically what we're going to do during the lecture portion of tonight is uh, uh, try and identify the effects that are illustrated by the data or by the figures and understand what's causing certain effects and then we'll apply it in the in-class exercise. Um, here are a list of terms that you may be asked to uh, define a handful of these in the midterm exam. Um, the midterm exam is going to include calculations, but it's also going to include a lot of uh, qualitative information that you have to be able to explain. And I don't like to think of it as regurgitation necessarily, but um, you know.
know, in order to be able to design and adapt your design to varying conditions out in the field, you have to understand fundamental concepts. And so here are a list of key terms that you should be prepared to define in an exam as it relates to chapter three. And at the beginning of your textbook, in the textbook at the beginning of chapter three, it gives you the definitions to these. So if you wanted to make flashcards for yourself, you know, it's all together in one spot and it'll make it really easy. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how much wastewater there is and what's in it. More detail about the nature of wastewater. And uh, quantifying the amount of wastewater depends on our ability to um, uh, measure flow both in a pipe and in open channel conditions because wastewater at different points in a treatment system and at a different points in a collection network are going to be uh, under pressure, most of the time open channel. But we'll start with uh, enclosed pipes. The easiest way from the standpoint of it requires no electricity to identify the flow rate through a pipe. This is an enclosed pipe and you can see the blue arrows here are indicating flow is from the left towards the right. Uh, this curve is just kind of uh, giving you a conceptual idea of a velocity profile where the velocity at the center of the pipe is the greatest and at the edge of the pipe the velocity is, uh, is decreasing because of shear stress at the, at the boundary of the liquid in the pipe. Um, but a piezometer, when you puncture a pipe, then the water would spray all over the, all over the place if we didn't put some sort of a tube attached to it. And that would be really bad, especially in the case of a wastewater pipe, if you just puncture a hole and it's spraying all over the place. But that's not what's done here in the, uh, in the image. We've punctured the pipe with a hole and then connected a tube to it. And there's two different connections. One of them is uh, pointing at the flow. This first one is intercepting the velocity. And these little dashed lines in fluid mechanics are called streamlines, just to identify the direction of the flow. And um, so the streamline terminates at the opening of this stagnation tube. And so in, although the water is flowing through the pipe, inside the pipe, conditions are static. And this blue uh, liquid inside the tube is just to indicate that you don't necessarily have to have the same liquid in a piezometer that you do flowing through a pipe. And a common uh, manometer liquid or piezometer liquid would be mercury because it's really dense and you don't have to measure as large of a DP in order to identify a difference in pressure. So you can see that um, the tube on the left is measuring uh, all three terms of the energy equation. Um, it's measuring the effect of the pressure head, the elevation head, and the velocity head. So uh, P divided by gamma is uh, a reflection of what's the pressure inside the pipe. Z, uh, for a horizontal pipe like shown here, we wouldn't have to keep track of a difference in elevation from the upstream tube to the downstream tube. And um, although the pressure is going to be a little bit higher here than it is a little bit higher in the pipe, you know, because the hydrostatic equation says the deeper you go into a liquid, the, the higher the pressure is. For a, a pressurized pipe, some small change in elevation between this opening and that opening really wouldn't account for a large enough change in pressure that we would have to worry too much about a difference in Z's. But the last term is really important, and that's why this tube is pointed into the flow, is it's directed into the flow so that it's going to measure the uh, velocity head. And you'll notice that the liquid, this blue manometer liquid, is rising higher on the left tube than it is on the right tube. And the reason why is this tube on the right, the downstream tube, isn't intercepting the streamlines. And so it's not capturing the velocity head in the same way that the upstream um, stagnation tube is. And so this DP, a change in pressure between the upstream and downstream tubes, is how you can calculate the velocity. In other words, uh, the change in pressure divided by gamma would tell you V squared divided by 2G. And so you could, if you measure the, uh, the change in height, and this delta P divided by gamma, if you just replace that with 
dp, or in other words, the delta h, the difference in the elevation between the two of them, then you can solve for what's the velocity going through the pipe. So piezometers are simple in that no electricity required. It's just a, a measurement with a ruler. Um, but it, uh, it doesn't have the ability for data logging or remote detection. And so sometimes we get a little bit more sophisticated when we are trying to uh, monitor flows. And so a turbine flow meter is uh, overcoming a couple of those limitations. A turbine flow meter, as you can see from this depiction here, there's some sort of a propeller on the inside of the pipe. And it spins faster with increasing flow rate. And before it's put into service, a curve is made that relates the rotational rate of the turbine to the average velocity inside of that pipe. And so the manufacturer who makes this turbine meter is going to give you some sort of a chart that says how quickly it's spinning versus what's the flow rate through the pipe. And the advantage of this is that you can measure it uh, away from the, uh, the gauge itself. You can record the data over time. It's a lot more sophisticated than a piezometer. But there are some obvious disadvantages of a turbine flow meter for a liquid like we're dealing with in wastewater. It's it's got chunks in it at this point. You know, if it's incoming wastewater, there may be debris or grit. Um, you know, more than anything, just the sand and the, the suspended particles could really um, cause a lot of trouble for the impeller blades on a turbine meter like this. And so if we have just a smooth pipe section and are somehow able to measure the flow rate without interacting with the flow at all in a physical way, then that would be a huge advantage. And that's what an ultrasonic uh, flow gauge is able to do. An ultrasonic flow gauge is sending um, uh, very rapid acoustic signals through the flow and is reflecting them off of particles or air bubbles. Something that's passing through the flow, it's basically uh, tracking the particles over time very quickly. And so it knows how quickly the particles are making their way through the test section and uh, quantifies that velocity into a flow rate based on the known uh, cross section of the pipe, the relationship between the flow at some depth into the pipe and the average flow rate. So an ultrasonic flow meter has some real big advantages because uh, there's no moving parts in the case of an ultrasonic flow meter. Uh, similar in, uh, in concept, but different in execution, is a magnetic flow meter. And uh, instead of sending uh, acoustic waves through the flow, in the case of a magnetic flow meter, it's actually, uh, there's a, a pair of magnets and a magnetic field is put through the pipe. And uh, here's a diagram that shows it a little bit more detail. You've got water flowing through a pipe section. And it can't be a metal pipe section, by the way. It has to be generally a plastic section, because if it's metallic, then that'll interfere with the magnetic field that's generated. So you've got a magnetic coil. And um, you know, adding electricity to an electromagnet, you're able to vary the strength of your magnetic field. And this is Faraday's law that says that uh, this mass that's passing through the magnetic field is going to generate an electrical current, E, um, that's measured on either side of the pipe. And so water mass is passing through this magnetic field. And uh, as uh, by virtue of these molecules passing through the magnetic field, then it generates an electrical current um, on the electrodes on either side of the pipe. And then you're able to measure the strength of that current E is related to the velocity of the flow through the pipe. And so the diameter of the pipe is known. That's this variable D. B is the strength of magnetic field. And so these are really cool, but they're also pretty costly. Um, when I was working on my graduate work, we borrowed a magnetic flow meter you know, similar to this from a Canadian company to do our research. And I think just the one meter was something like $10,000. I was always worried I was going to drop it when I was moving around in the lab. Um, it worked great. It gave us really wonderful data. But it would be pretty expensive if you had a pipe gallery and we're trying to measure the flow rate in lots of different spots. 
uh, to use magnetic flow meters in all of them. So, any questions so far about how we measure flow in closed conduits? Open channel flow is also really common in wastewater treatment, especially um, when the flow starts coming into the treatment plant. And uh, one way of measuring open channel flow is with the sharp crested weir. Now this is kind of a little bit deceptive. This picture, at first when I looked at this picture, I thought it was a flume. Um, but it's actually not. It's a sharp crested weir. And the way that you would measure the flow rate is just there's a known relationship between the depth of water inside uh, upstream of the, uh, this V-notch weir and what the flow rate is going through it. And so um, it would need to be calibrated before it's put into use. And the same thing is well, a similar thing with a broad crested weir. The way that a broad crested weir works is that it induces critical flow over this long obstacle that's put in the channel. This is a channel, this is an obstacle that's so tall that upstream of the channel, the water has to get deeper to get over it. You know, initially when it's put into place, it backs the water up a little bit. And then as the water is going over that obstacle, it reaches critical depth. And if you know the, the width of the channel and that it's critical depth, then you can quantify the flow rate um, by knowing where to measure that critical depth. Um, you know, going towards more sophisticated electronic means of measuring the flow rate, uh, you see there's an ultrasonic depth measurement device here. And what they've done is put this, uh, this device where there's a fixed height above the bottom of the channel. This uh, sensor never varies its location, but the water levels are going to vary over time. And in a flume like this, it has a converging section and a downhill section that induces a hydraulic jump. And um, if you are measuring the depth of the flow where a hydraulic jump is induced inside of a partial flume, then those can be correlated with empirical equations to a flow rate through the flume of a certain throat. And so here's just a a picture of a real-world application of a flume. It looks like this is inside of a manhole. And here is the ultrasonic meter. And it's constantly measuring what's the depth of the water inside of that flume so that it can be translated into a flow rate. And you typically see something like this at the, uh, at the front of a wastewater treatment plant just so that they can always keep track of what's the flow coming into the plant. All right. Um, so this is one of the tables that's taken from the text. And the effect that I'd like for us to take a look at is how does household size and uh, conservation efforts, um, how does that change the amount of wastewater that is generated on a per capita basis? Now, there's a pretty good relationship between drinking water that's consumed and wastewater that's generated. And we touched on that last week, that most of the drinking water that's consumed ends up in a uh, sanitary sewer. And in a lot of places, like here in Huntington, they charge you your sewer rate based on how much water you use. And so the Huntington Sanitary Board here in town actually gets information from West Virginia American Water on how much water each household is using. And then they base their bills based on how much water you use. They don't have like a separate wa wastewater meter at each house. Um, so there are some differences though. Indoor water use isn't uh, exactly correlated with wastewater generation, but this first table we're going to look at, it's uh, illustrating, you can see in each row is a different number of people in a household. And so what trend do we see with increasing household size on the number, the amount of wastewater that's generated per person? All right, per person, right. So um, why is that? How can, how can we explain that effect? Why would having eight people in a house mean that they're using less water per person than if it was just two? Okay? Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. So 
uh, let's say boiling spaghetti is an example. You know, if you're boiling spaghetti for two, maybe you're boiling three quarts of water. But if you're boiling spaghetti for eight, maybe you use, you know, four quarts of water. You don't use that much more. There's some like fixed demand for activities, regardless of how many people are using it. That fixed demand um, doesn't doesn't change. And so maybe it's mopping your floor, you know, cleaning the tub, whatever it is. Um, you know, there is, there is some incremental demand for water, an in, incremental increase in, uh, in the amount of wastewater that's generated. You know, if you multiply 7 times 58 and 8 times 57, this is still more wastewater. 8 times 57 is still greater than 7 times 58. And so 8 people will use more water than 7, but it's just that on a per person basis, there are some savings the more people you can cram into a household. <laughs> so, um, now, let's take a look at what it is saying if you, uh, if you really are going for extensive conservation. Um, you know, how effective is that? It, it's easiest to see on one person because that 100 gallons per person per day, you think of that as about 100%, and so 74 it means that they're saving, you know, approximately 25% of the wastewater that would be generated by conservation. And so, um, you're probably aware of some of the measures that are taken to conserve water. What sorts of things have you seen out there on campus or other businesses or in your travels? How do people try and save water? All right. Mm hmm Right. Those are just a couple that come to mind. Here on campus, there, there are some toilets, none in this building I've seen, but over in Smith Hall, there are, uh, hi. In Smith Hall, there's some, well, we've got some more. Did you guys all ride over together? Yeah. Okay, um, so as I was saying, in Smith Hall, there are some, uh, some urinals that uh, say on it, you know, uses 85% less water than a standard toilet. And so, you know, that's, I think each flush is only one pint of water. And I'm really bad with traditional units when it comes to liquid. How many pints are in a gallon? Is it 16? <laughs> 16? Okay, so there are some urinals where each flush is a full gallon of water. And so obviously there's big savings if you uh, are just using one pint instead of one gallon. Um, any other ideas on what extensive conservation might include? Low flow shower heads. Everybody seen those? Shorter showers. Shorter showers. Yeah, public awareness is, uh, is a big thing. And I came across a website today as I was preparing for our lecture that was uh, 105 ideas for saving water. And some of them are kind of ridiculous. Like, if you see a faucet that's dripping, call a plumber. You know, well, obviously, but I, I don't know. And like statistics, one drop of water every five seconds adds up to, it was saying, five gallons a day. So, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of water, I suppose. But this is extensive conver uh, conservation. So, you know, this is the U.S. average. If you really try and get people to save water, they're still going to be generating a lot of wastewater. So, uh, you'll need to use this data on the in-class exercise that we're going to do later this evening. All right. Let me just pop. Okay, so the last slide we were looking at residential, typical wastewater generation rates. Here are some uh, commercial um, characteristics and it's interesting to look at different types of businesses and uh, see how much wastewater do they generate. 
you know, it, it's kind of mystifying that this data actually exists, but somebody is probably like a master's thesis went out and uh, measured wastewater rates coming from lots of different types of businesses. And um, just to sort of poke through the data a little bit, I asked the question, why do you think the apartment wastewater flow rates are so much lower than a single family home? You know, this, what we were looking at before, this is for people living in a house. So, you know, if one person is living in a house, they'll generate 103 gallons per person per day. 103 gallons, remember that. So what about one person in an apartment? It says that the typical gallons per person, uh, gallons per apartment person per day is 38 instead of 103. So why do you suppose that someone living in an apartment generates so much less wastewater than someone living in a house? Okay. I agree with both of those, but both of those are water consumption that you wouldn't normally think would get into the wastewater. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So some apartments have laundry hookups. A lot of them don't. Okay, good point. So I think one of the uh, things that here, that's here is a laundromat. Is that here or is it on an, another? Laundry, self-service, yeah. Okay, so that's a separate thing. If you look, it's saying a load of laundry is 38 gallons. So that could be a big chunk of what's different between an apartment and the different between a house is that you know, you're separating out. First of all, they're smaller. And so, on average, and so, um, you know, less cleaning, um, but laundry is probably a big part of it. And, uh, you know, you were talking about the car washing and irrigation. Um, I think that that actually does have an impact on this figure of 103 because sometimes the laterals that go from somebody's house out to the main sewer line in the street, those can get cracked. And so if you are watering your lawn, some of that water that you're, you're adding is going to infiltrate into the pipe. And so some of it is probably just in an apartment building. On a per person basis, there's less water getting in that's kind of uh, this infiltration and inflow that actually isn't supposed to be in the collection network. So that's one of the things that I wanted to ask about is the difference between living situations. You know, people living in an apartment, living in apartments generate less wastewater. And there's been like uh, a lot of discussion about how it's a lot more efficient for people to live in high density um, areas than it is to live in the suburbs, like in terms of preserving the environment and being uh, energy efficient. And what we have to keep in mind is that generating wastewater also generates electricity demands. Because for every gallon of water that I put into the sewer, down at the treatment plant, they're having to use electricity to purify that water. And so it, it seems like well, water is a renewable resource. It is. You know, every time it rains, you get a fresh supply of water. But what's not renewable is the electricity we use to purify the water before we discharge it back into the river. So, you know, if if you can get people to use 38 gallons per day instead of 103, then maybe there are some efficiencies to be captured by high density dwellings. All right, what about this? This is maybe a little bit of a critical thinking question. Why is it that a conference center is going to generate more wastewater per person than the theater? Because at first glance, it seems like it's a similar thing. A conference center is you know, like maybe a convention center where you'd go to uh, Comic-Con or you'd go listen to some technical speeches at a conference center. Six gallons per person per day at a conference center compared to the theater, only 2.3. Why not? <laughs> okay. So maybe you're more interested in the theater, so you stay in your seats. That's an interesting idea. All right. Uh huh. 
Hmm. Well, I guess, I guess maybe you have a point there. Yes, seats versus people. So you're saying, what if it was per person attending the theater? Yeah. All right. That could be it. That, that could be it. Very good. That's what I figured. As I figured, you know, I'm at the theater two or maybe three hours if it's like a long one, you know, Braveheart or something. Um, so, but a, a conference center, you could be there all day long. So it's probably related to, to time as well. All right. Now, it may seem like, why are we just poking our way through this data? It's because a lot of what engineers do is planning. You know, we don't always limit our efforts to design work. Uh, you may have to put together projections on how many people are going to live in an area 20 years in the future. And you know, the design begins with all of these planning assumptions. And so we have to be a little bit stronger at um, learning to make reasonable assumptions and talking and reasoning our way through the planning process because that's where you can save the most money is not by making the sewer uh, network really efficient, but um, reducing how much demand you design it for only to that which is actually going to be there. So I think that it's really important to, to get in the habit of asking why and how on things like this in the table. So why does a guest in a hotel generate more wastewater than a person in an apartment? Because those seem very similar to me. You know, it's like a high density dwelling, you don't have the yard effect, Neither of them maybe are going to have their own in-suite laundry facilities. But look at uh, hotel. So the hotel is saying uh, 53 gallons per person per day versus an apartment is 38. OK, yeah, washing the sheets more often. Absolutely, that's what I do when I go to a hotel. I'm taking like an hour-long shower because you don't pay for the, uh, the water. It's, yeah, you just let it run, man. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. But actually, the laundry thing's a big, that's a huge thing. And you've probably seen on your pillow, they're always saying, oh, leave your, uh, this on your pillow when we won't make your bed and uh, hang up your towel and we won't change that because they're trying to save water, they say. But really, you know, I was trying to cheat you out of your... Water demands. All right, so good. Those are some of the commercial flow rates. Here's some institutional flow rates, just looking at differences between, I was surprised at how much people in prisons, how much water they use in the prison. 90 gallons, that's more than in an apartment. I don't know what it is about a prison that makes them use so much water. I guess they're hosing off fight areas or something. I don't know. <laughs> if somebody's getting beat up and they gotta hose it all down. <laughs> Who knows why they're using that much water in a prison. But um, the, the point is with this is just there really is data for anything that you want. So rather than just gathering a guess out of thin air, uh, what's always more defensible in a planning situation is to look at what other people have assumed and go and you know, as a starting point say, well, you know, here in this book they're saying that in boarding school they're using 38 gallons per person per day at the boarding school. And, you know, if you need to make adjustments along the way, you can. Uh, likewise, there's data for recreational facilities. And, uh, you know, so a country club, 18.8 gallons of wastewater gets generated for every member who goes to the country club per day. And uh, your country clubs do have showers and bathroom facilities, and maybe you're staying a lot longer than you would compared to like a camping facility. Oh, the same thing. Country Club 18.8, .8, toilets at a camp 18.8. .8. It's probably just coincidental. All right, well, let's uh, take a break from the nonstop talking. And I'd like you to uh, think about how you use water, your own habits, on a one-week basis. So Sunday through Saturday, look at this rate of water uses per appliance. This is one of the figures in the textbook. It says, you know, uh, the range of demands. Oh, gen, you know, we're talking about generating wastewater. So this isn't only using fresh water, but if you uh, take a bath, for example, they're saying typically 
that would uh, result in 30 gallons per use. But maybe you have a big tub and you fill it all the way up, so maybe you're generating 35 gallons. And maybe you take three baths a day. And so um, I'd like you to go through this and think about what applies to you. And I'll pause the recording. We'll maybe have five or six minutes for you to just, in the margins of your notes, think about how much water you think you'll use in a week. And then we'll compare that to um, a, another figure in the book that actually breaks it down by percentages. All right, feel free to. All right, as we get into this, I want to make one distinction. And that is, this table that we were looking at before, where it was saying 103 gallons per person per day, that is both the indoor and the outdoor wastewater generation. Um, the textbook has a couple of different tables, and what we're going to look at here in a minute, it, a minute is just the indoor wastewater generation. And if you look at this list of activities that was identified here, these are all indoor uses. And so um, anybody want to volunteer how much water, how much wastewater are you going to generate in a week? In a week? Is that? Oh, in a week? Yeah. Uh, did you do it on a daily basis? Yeah. We'll okay. What did you end up with on a day? About 80 gallons. 80? All right. Are you still working on yours, Selena? Okay. Anybody else got theirs already? 800 in a week? Okay. 800 in a week. And so what is that in a day? 120, 110, 115. All right. In a day. What other numbers? Are you still working on yours? Do you have it? How, how much? 1,000? Where is it all coming from? Why so much? Long showers? Yeah, okay, all right, all right, that's a lot. 200 gallons a day? Wow, where, where is it all coming from? Mine was a shower once a day. Okay. And I think I overestimated the faucet usage. Faucet usage? I was amazed by the faucet usage as well because I'm saying if I do one load of dishes a day, that's 70 gallons in a week. But then if you're running the faucet just five minutes a day, that's more than the uh, water of the dishwasher. So, you know, I ended up with 87 gallons in a week from running the faucet just to rinse the food off the dishes. You know how you have to wash the dishes before you put them in the dishwasher? <laughs> so I use more water pre-washing them than the dishwasher actually does. Cooking? So you, you identified uh, other uses not, not listed here? Oh, faucet running. Oh, faucet running. OK. I see. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that's true. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a front-loading washing machine, so at least I'm saving a little bit of water there, 20 gallons per load instead of 45. But still, I estimated I'd do three loads a week. See, you don't want to let your running clothes sit too long, right? That's not good. So uh, in this next slide, it shows the distribution for residential indoor. And that's just what we've been talking about in this example. And they say, on average, um, the typical, it's listing both the, uh, the percentage and the amounts. Um, now, I'm not sure about this bath, 1.2 gallons per person per day. That doesn't make sense to me because they said a bath is 30 gallons. So they're saying people only take one bath a week, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> huh? Yeah, it, the percentage is 1.8%. And they're saying the typical water usage is 1.2 gallons per person per day for bath. All right. Faucet, though. They're saying 10.4 for faucet. I was saying that I'd use 12.5 gallons per day at the faucet. Shower, my estimate was uh, 25 gallons per day. They're saying 11.7. I guess my showers are too long, maybe. Um, that's a short shower, man. That's like Marines or something. Get in, get out. Nobody gets hurt, you know. 
like quick showers. Toilet flushing. I estimated I'd use uh, 45 gallons a week for toilet flushing. They're saying the average is 18 per day. And so I maybe was underestimate, underestimating the toilet use there. So it's kind of interesting to, to see, you know, mine, mine worked out to uh, 70 gallons per day, I thought, as an indoor use. And they're saying the typical is 65. So, I mean, 65 is the typical. I was estimating 70 gallons per day for myself. Some of you are really using way too much water. You need to look inside yourself and ask, how am I using the Earth's resources? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not trying to give you a hard time. Just joking. So um, here's an interesting table that's in the text that's showing how water changes, uh, water consumption varies as a function of geography. And Selena, you're from Nepal, right? Nepal is one of the countries that uses the least amount of water. Why is it that in Nepal, they only use eight gallons per person per day, but in the United States, we use 100? Small country? I don't understand how that would affect how much water you use. You still have to um, do all the same things, right? OK. But this is per capita. Yeah. Not sure? All right. I don't know. Is it, is it expensive? Is water's more expensive? I know in some countries, like in Egypt, for example, they sell water house to house. Like people with backpacks walk the water up and down the street, delivering it in the same way that, you know, here in the U.S. they used to deliver milk to your doorstep. There they deliver water. Um, not all of the neighborhoods, obviously, but some of them don't have a distribution network. And so there's probably many places in Nepal that they don't have a pipe network, right? I mean, the big cities do, maybe, but the, the smaller villages, maybe you're going to a well. And if you have to carry the water, you know, like you've seen pictures of people carrying water with baskets on their head, I probably wouldn't use eight gallons per day if I had to carry it somewhere on my head. I'd probably use like a pint or something. I wouldn't be using any water. One of the huge surprises here, though, for me was Norway. And let me show you this figure here. This is showing water availability by country. Water availability looks at rainfall patterns, land area, and population. So you can see it's cubic meters per year per person. So Canada is dark green for several reasons. There's hardly any people in Canada, lots of land, and it's very wet. So that's why Canada is dark green. They have lots of water. Uh, Egypt is white, meaning the availability of water there is very low in Egypt because they have lots of people, it's very arid, and, uh, you know, it's, a, I guess, a big country, but relative to its population, the water availability is low. Um, so why do you suppose Norway why do people in Norway only use 29 gallons per person per day? Why aren't they using more water in Norway? It's a rich country. You know, they, they've got plenty of money. It's, uh, they're on the list of the top, uh, the richest countries in the world. It's like Norway, Brunei, um, Qatar, Luxembourg, and Singapore. So Norway is the only European country in the top five richest countries in the world. But it's in the top five. It's colder. And? All right. All right, maybe. But they're still flushing the toilet, though, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'd use up 29 gallons a day just with that, I think. <laughs> well, no, not quite, no. Um, you know, a lot of... Uh, a lot of European countries put a huge focus on efficiency and conservation. And all I could figure there is you know, there's no reason for Norway not to be using more water because they have really high availability. You know, they're dark green, meaning it's very wet in Norway. Uh, the population is low. The land area is big. So they, it, it's not because of a shortage that they're using a little bit of water. And it's not because they can't afford it or don't have the infrastructure. 
Uh, but I think it's probably, in Norway, maybe an efficiency thing, where they're really doing their best to save very little water. What about this one? What about Kuwait? How do they manage to use that much water? And I think this is probably, this per capita water consumption that's listed there, it's probably dated. Um, because when I was living in, I used to live in the United Arab Emirates, which is this tiny little country right there, right between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So here's the UAE. And when I was there, they were using about the same as the US. They were in the UAE, they were using about 100 gallons per person per day. But we don't have that in this list. We do have Kuwait, which is a very similar country in a lot of ways. So if they are a country with low availability, where is it coming from in Kuwait? Do you know where they get their water there? Hmm? Seawater? That's right. To fresh water. Yeah, they desalinate their water there. They use, you know, there's a variety of ways to do it. There's thermal distillation where um, they use natural gas for electricity in a lot of the Gulf. So they're burning natural gas to generate electricity and then they have all this leftover heat from, uh, from burning the natural gas and they, they uh, boil water with that extra heat and then as they boil the water they condense it and that's thermal distillation. They drink that desalinated water. There's also reverse osmosis where they're putting it through a membrane that the water molecules go through the membrane but the salt um, ions stay out. But uh, all throughout the Gulf, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, everywhere, they're using um, desalination. It's really, really expensive. And so the 53 gallons per person per day that they're using in Kuwait is coming at a very high economic cost and at a very high energy cost as well. So we talked about Norway. All right, what about this? Um, when you have high availability, like in Canada, they're, they're high on the list, 196 gallons per person per day. So they're using the most water. But they still have plenty of water. So do you think there's any reason why they should be encouraged to conserve in Canada if they've got plenty of water? I've heard arguments both ways. Um, I read an article one time about the country of Iceland. Here is Iceland. Where is it? All right, here is Iceland. And the argument that I read was that Iceland should use as much water as it possibly can because they have lots of water and um, their electricity in Iceland is from renewable fuels, meaning that they have geothermal to produce most of their electricity. That there's, um, I guess, volcanoes and uh, close to the surface and they drill down and the water heats and that they're able to uh, have steam-driven electricity from the geothermal. So in Canada, though, um, I think they have a lot of hydropower in the west of Canada, but in the east, they're burning the coal and natural gas the same as we are in the United States. So they have a lot of water, but remember, when it gets into the treatment plant, it has to be purified, and so that requires uh, the consumption of energy to clean up the water. So is there any reason to decrease water consumption when availability is high? I think there is a reason, and that is you still have to pay for the cleanup. And you may have a lot of water, but you can't, once you use that water, you can't just dump it in the river. You have to clean it up, and it's expensive to clean up. Especially if you're using 196, if all of that is getting into the, uh, into the sewer, then that's really a high volume to purify. Mozambique, on the other hand, they're using only three gallons per person per day. Mozambique, I think, is this one, right above South, South Africa. So they don't have much, and they're not using a lot. All right. Temporal distribution is in bold here, because it's a phrase I think every engineer should know what temporal distribution means. I'll definitely, you know how we were talking about there will be uh, terms that you need to define on the exam. And so I listed the chapter three terms in the notes. You should learn all of the words that's on this list, the terminology, be, be able to define each of those words. Well, temporal distribution is another phrase that you have to be able to di uh, define. 
It basically just means the distribution of some characteristic over time. Temporal means time, and distribution is just meaning how things vary during time. So this figure that's shown here illustrates the temporal distribution of wastewater flows over time. We talked about this last week, how people in the middle of the night aren't using much water, and so there's not much wastewater being generated at night. Compared to the average daily flow, which is 100%, the flow rate goes down to 50% of the average at night. And then the peak, there's a peak where it gets as, as high as 150%. Um, and this is showing it in the morning hours. And there's also a second bump in the evening. I've seen different temporal distribution charts where sometimes they're showing the evening bump bigger than the morning bump. This one is showing the morning bump larger, but whatever. The point is, is that temporal distribution is just how things vary over time. So um, what about weekday versus weekend? What? Okay, so first of all, before we talk about why, what is the difference? The peak's later, meaning what? If, if it's a morning, in, if it's like a morning peak, what's causing that morning peak? Getting up for work, showering. Okay, so then going to the cause of that shift, if you're comparing the weekday to the weekend, uh, what explains the difference? You were saying that it's just people sleep in on the weekend, right? So instead of showering at 8 a.m., maybe you're showering at noon. <laughs> on a lucky weekend, you know, like sleeping as late as you can, right? Catch up. Uh, so that's pretty interesting data uh, that shows the shift between the two. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that the peak is actually lower. Here the peak is high for the weekday, and the weekend the peak is lower. Any guesses on what could explain why the peak is lower on the weekend? <laughs> okay, maybe you're taking a break. Maybe you shower after the workout, right? You're going to the gym first. It's also said the weekend is higher. So okay, you right. Stuff later on today. Good observation, you yeah. So the peak is lower, but everything else is higher. Yeah, everything else is higher during the day. Because why? Maybe you're catching up on chores that use water on the weekend that you didn't do during the week. Maybe on a per day basis, more people are doing laundry on the weekend, more people are doing cleaning. And so it's really important for us to understand when the wastewater is coming to the treatment plant. We have to understand so much about when the wastewater comes to the treatment plant because we've got this whole ecosystem of bacteria living at the wastewater treatment plant on the waste that comes to them from the population upstream. And uh, we have to keep them alive because they're the things that are breaking down the BOD. It's this colony of, it's, it's a really diverse ecosystem of micro, uh, microorganisms in the treatment plant. And so we have to know backwards and forwards what these patterns are like so that we're able to uh, design the storage of the flow equalization, the storage, all the things we need to get them a steady supply of the food that they're breaking down. All right, one last thing about this temporal distribution chart. It also is showing how the patterns were back at turn of the century. And this is interesting that they've got this data. It's from New York City. They were able to, I guess, between 1905 and 1910, they monitored the, uh, the wastewater as it came to the treatment plant in New York. And so how have trends changed since the early 1900s? Okay, yeah. All right, yeah, those are all really good ideas. You know, we're using more water than we ever have, and so it's probably more peaky than it's ever been. Probably back then the construction standards weren't as tight, and so pipes weren't fit together as well. There was more cracks in the collection network, and so there probably was a lot more infiltration. So that's why uh, it doesn't peak as high. Looks like maybe people woke up a little bit earlier back then. Um, 
I have to believe that they weren't showering as often. You know, they say, like back then, indoor plumbing was uh, like a rare thing. I don't know. Maybe in New York City it wasn't back in 1905, but there are probably tons of places in America that didn't have indoor plumbing yet by, by here. But it looks like the lows aren't as low and the highs aren't as high back in those days. And so I think those are probably related to more infiltration and inflow and people using less water back then than they're using now. Now what about this? This is going to blow your mind. Is How might the flow patterns change in the future? Like think about human behavior, where things were in the past, where they are now. If we were going to ch draw, you know, in the year 2000, <laughs> Like that Conan O'Brien skit, you know? No, like let, let's say 20, by the year 2100, what would the chart look like? Draw a little sketch in the margin, your prediction of not necessarily exactly how low it's going to go or something like that, but do you think it'll be the same? Do you think it'll be different? Just uh, reason through your prediction of how water use patterns and how wastewater generation patterns in the future would be different than they are now and what that'll look like graphically. It's a great movie. <laughs> it's, it's sad because it's true. <laughs> so we'll just be drinking Gatorade, like electrolyte from the water fountain. <laughs> All right, in 2100, how will wastewater uh, patterns vary? All right. So what do you, how do you think things are going to be different in the future? Any ideas? Okay, use less water. How would that happen? How or why? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It, there is uh, like uh, shampoo that you can, wa it's, they call it dry shampoo. You don't have to take a shower. So maybe there will be like a dry, you wipe down your body and you don't have to shower. Um, there are toilets that are vacuum toilets. They don't use water. I think there's just a few places, maybe in South Korea, they're beginning to use like pneumatic toilets, similar to like an airplane where it's just air. I was going to say some high-rises have. Right. Okay, so maybe in the future people will use less water. What other predictions do you have about water in the future? You think we're going to use more? Just because that's how it goes in America? Okay. Why? Better efficiency with especially on that's a huge contributor. Uh huh. Yeah, because you know it's all it, the INI is basically all we've got here at night. So if there's less INI, then it would be peaks we get higher. Okay, so we'll say the trend will be hopefully less I and I, and that may be variable based on where you live. You know, here in Huntington, they'll never be able to fix their sewers here unless like the federal government steps in and gives them millions and millions of dollars. But I just don't know where the money they. They have to uh, try and avoid combined sewer overflows. You know, they've got a program to try and uh, limit the number of times they discharge wastewater to the river. But you know, as for uh, taking out a, an undersized pipe and putting it in a, a new big pipe, I just don't know how they'd ever be able to afford it. They're not collecting enough money for maintaining the infrastructure, much less replacing it. Really? How's it going? How are they doing? Is it as dire as I make it out to be? Well, we have a private contract for Paris. Uh-huh. About 10 cities. And this is a big part of this is getting the funding. And it's intermittent. 
this, but it would kind of be like we're we're doing some things right now to mitigate their low cost. It's just a long term plan. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just going to take a long time because all it is. Yeah. I think that um, if you look at how generous the federal government was able to be in the 70s, you know, back in the 70s when a lot of the municipalities had to reach better targets for what they discharge into rivers, you know, a lot of cities had trouble putting nice treatment plants together when the EPA was making stricter water quality laws. So the, the federal government gave money to the cities to put in a better treatment plant, but I think maybe the money's starting to dry up, you know, there's less money on research, everybody wants lower taxes, less spending, so and hopefully, hopefully they'll be able to repair their network here and get away from combined sewers bit by bit, but um, we'll see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess the bright spots there, the indoor practice facility at Marshall that they just put over by the football field, they've got local storage there. Uh, the new cookout restaurant over on Fifth Avenue, everybody's been to cookout now, right? They've got porous pavement in the parking lot, and they've got, I think, underground storage of the rainwater that's generated there. So all of that in the past would just go straight into the sewer, but nowadays they're starting to be a little bit better about reducing stormwater flows. I guess that is a bright spot. I shouldn't be such a pessimist all the time. <laughs> okay. When it's really rainy is when it does that. When it discharges without treatment. I mean, it always goes to the river eventually, but um, on the dry days, they can treat it before they discharge it. Yeah. You can go, if you walk around in Ritter Park the day after it rained, you can smell it it discharges to Four Pole Creek in Ritter Park. So I go jogging over there occasionally, and I can always smell if it rained yesterday because uh, combined sewer overflow. All right, so my guess would be, so if it's going to be less I and I, then maybe it would be more flashy than it was in the past. But um, there's also a trend here of big cities versus small cities that we'll look at. Here it is. So anybody know what this picture on the left is at the bottom? No? Nope. Shanghai, right, yeah. You thought this was the Space Needle, right? What's the name of this? What's it called? Oriental TV Tower? Okay. Looks beautiful. On the right is a town called Fossil, Oregon. Small town, big town. So here is wastewater generation. What it says is that a large city has less peaks than a small town. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Why do you think that a big city has a more steady wastewater generation rate than a small town? Okay. Yeah, in the city that never sleeps, you know, they call New York City the city that never sleeps. Maybe one person, their work begins at midnight. So they work midnight to 8 a.m. So you know, their whole daily routine is offset from the normal. And so in a big city like Shanghai, there are people working around the clock, and that sort of uh, distributes the activities that cause the variations. Very good. OK. So. Another great point is it's not only residential generation that goes to the treatment plant. It could be uh, industrial and commercial uh, wastewater that's going to the treatment plant as well in a big city. And I think there's also a spatial effect. If you look at a, uh, a small town, all right, so here's a small town. This is Fossil, Oregon, where they've got one main street and then you know, a couple of side streets here. Okay, and then here's the, uh, the wastewater treatment plant in Fossil, Oregon. If everyone in Fossil, Oregon, it's the Super Bowl, and uh, they go to the bathroom and everyone flushes the toilet all at once in Fossil, Oregon, then the water travels very quickly. If everyone flushes at the same time, it gets 
all at once to the wastewater treatment plant. Okay, now Shanghai. All right, so so many pipes in Shanghai because it's lots of streets, it's an enormous network. The travel time is much larger in Shanghai so that even if everyone flushes at one time, my flush has to travel all the way down here and it begins to spread out during the flush and so someone is here and even if everyone's on the same work schedule, there's this uh, travel time issue and um, it's called routing, the routing effect. Uh, routing is the word that we use for travel time through a network. So I think that those two things, in, in a big city, there's a, a larger variety of work schedules and living schedules. And then in a big city, there's also more routing time to be accounted for compared to a small town. So if you're designing the wastewater treatment plant in a small town, you're in trouble because remember, you have to keep your bacteria alive. And if it's a small town with a new network and very little I&I, &I, then there may be periods during the night where you're not getting enough liquid and enough BOD to keep the, uh, to keep the colony alive. So maybe you need, it, there's a greater need for flow equalization in a small town than in a large town. Maybe in a large town, flow equalization is just that it's a large town and, and a separate tank isn't required. So the effect is uh, larger peaks in small towns, and we've talked about what's responsible for that effect. Any comments or questions before we move on? All right. Here is a nice photo of a uh, pipe network that probably needs some work. You can see it's cracked and broken. It's going to have groundwater seeping in. When the water table is high, or if it's raining and there is uh, water seeping into the soil from the surface, then that uh, groundwater is going to get into the sanitary sewer and go to the treatment plant. Um, sometimes infiltration and inflow are considered together. They, they call it just I and I, or just I slash I, infiltration and inflow. And the reason why they're sometimes lumped together is that unless you do a really detailed flow study, it's difficult to distinguish where that extra flow is coming from. It's just you know that it's water that shouldn't be in the network that is. That's what, that's what infiltration and inflow have in common is you don't really want it in your network. A sanitary sewer is only supposed to be carrying the wastewater that's coming from a residential area or from a commercial or industrial place. And so uh, infiltration inflow doesn't really have any business but uh, it being in the network. But we differentiate between these different types of inflow just based on uh, whether it's coming immediately during a storm, as in the case of direct inflow. Like if it's rainy, uh, the water that comes into the pipe network very quickly would be considered direct inflow. And there's this term in the book used of inappropriate connections. So those are like roof drains or uh, the sump pump on somebody's basement that shouldn't be going into a sanitary sewer because it's not polluted, contaminated water. Um, direct inflow is that inappropriate connection that is immediately released during a storm, but delayed inflow is just, uh, it's after a wet weather event, it gets into the pipe network more slowly. So it makes more sense here looking at this graph. The lower line on this graph that's just horizontal is infiltration. Remember, infiltration is groundwater that's getting into the pipe network because it has cracks or the pipes aren't fit together correctly. And it's very steady over time. The groundwater level maybe is going to go up and down a little bit as it rains, but infiltration is steady. This curved line, and it's showing one day, two day, three days, and so there's a steady typical pattern. Here it's showing the morning bump, the evening bump, and a low part in the middle of the night. And so if you average for several days in a row, this is the typical amount of water that's going through the pipe network. But then there's a rainy day. 
And so here between day two and day, uh, two, between day one and two is a rainy day. And so it's showing the effect of the direct inflow. And remember, direct inflow are those connections to someone's roof, like uh, instead of having the stormwater go out into the yard, they have that pipe connected to the pipe network. And as soon as it rains, it comes in. Um, the delayed inflow is the storm is over at the end of day two. Um, you know, here at two, the storm is over, but the water level is still higher than it was. And that's because maybe the foundation drains are still working, someone's sump pump. It can be just uh, water that is getting into the pipe network through manhole covers. And it gradually goes lower and lower until it gets back to the normal. But what about this? This, uh, this plateau here, that doesn't seem to make sense. Like nothing in nature all of a sudden plateaus like that. Um, why is it that the flow in the sewer would be going high and high and high and then it would reach some maximum for a few minutes and then it would start going back down again? There's a clue right above that bypass flow or overflows. Um, all the extra flow that's above this line is a combined sewer overflow. And so that extra amount that's going into Four Pole Creek or going into the Ohio River during a rainy event is, uh, is this extra peak here that's in the dashed line. Is it should be in the sewer, but it's not. So I guess, you know, we've got the water that shouldn't be in the sewer, but is, that's infiltration and inflow. And then there, because of infiltration and inflow and other things, then there's water that should be in the sewer that uh, we don't have room for during a wet weather event, and it ends up in the river without treatment. Here's a really good diagram that shows uh, how a combined sewer works and what happens during a wet weather event. Let me dim the lights so it's easier to see. Um, this illustrates we've got residential areas and businesses and uh, so the sewer water, this, this brown water here, this is coming from uh, the kitchen, from the shower, from the toilet. This is fine. We don't, it's okay for this wastewater to be going in here. But what we're not happy about is if the parking lot has a drain and the drain from the parking lot is also going to the sewer because um, a couple of reasons it's not good for that water to be in there. Number one is when that parking lot water gets to the treatment plant, it has to be treated just like all the other water. You know, it reduces the BOD, but still um, the cost of treating water is partly aerating it, it's partly lifting it and moving it from place to place. It's not all in just having BOD in it. So, it's better if that fresh water isn't mixed with the wastewater. It would be better to have only the wastewater in the combined sewer. You can see that the water that's on someone's roof may be getting into the combined sewer. And so here is a, a, a weir. And when the water level gets high in the pipe, when it gets towards the top and uh, flows over it, then it goes directly into the river without any treatment. But during a dry day, the water level isn't very high inside the pipe, so it won't overflow this weir and it will just go directly towards the treatment plant. So a combined sewer is really bad news on a wet day, but even on a dry day, you're still having to pay for treatment that it would be better to save the money not to treat it. Here is another illustration. This one is from the text that's showing how a combined sewer works. Rather than a pipe with a weir in it, this diagram is showing like a vault that is uh, storing water. You know, the, the water from the collection network goes into this vault. And when the water level is low, it goes towards the treatment facility. But when it starts getting deeper and deeper, more than can be collected towards the treatment facility, then it overflows into the river in this combined sewer. So Huntington has a combined sewer, and most of the cities on the East Coast do. Um, as you move further west in the United States, there are fewer and fewer combined sewers. Why do you think that is? Why is it that 
combined sewers are more common in the eastern United States than they are in the west. Okay. Okay, yeah. That's a big part of it too, yeah. Yeah. You know, here in Huntington, um, you know, it's an old town, but also because it's a wet town, you, they wanted to have some way to get water away from the city and in towards the river, and so they built a, a sewer that served both of those purposes, transporting waste and moving water out of the way. All right, so let's look into a little bit more detail the relationship between rainfall and wastewater flow rates. Um, here's an image of something that's called a tipping bucket. And it's a rain gauge that there would be a funnel on top of it that's not pictured. And when it rains, the water goes through this funnel and uh, it causes this to make a tip and it's counting when the... Uh, uh, when the, how, how often it's tipping back and forth, it's marking the time of it, and so it's just a way of knowing when the rainfall happens. And so the more tips there are in a certain hour would give you an idea of the rainfall intensity. Um, it's also possible to measure the flow rate inside of a catch basin at the street, like just the, uh, the water goes off of the street in towards the sewer, and uh, this is a, a stream gauge that I've started using recently that measures pressure. It's, very, it's a cheap gauge, but it's very accurate, and it can just tell you the flow rate over time. And then uh, the way that you would monitor the flow coming into the treatment plant might be with a weir, like is shown here. And uh, what's interesting in this, this is at the treatment plant. It's showing that when it's raining, the flow rate at the treatment plant is going up, but then we've got that flat plateau there. And what's that again? Do you remember what that indicates? Yeah, overflow. It's when all of a sudden your flow rate goes and stops at some point, then you know that there's a discharge to the river. All right. I mentioned last week that we would uh, take a break sometime, usually most weeks, between 6.30 and 7. Let's take a, a five-minute break right now. Go ahead and get a drink of water. Use the restroom. We'll start again in five minutes. Uh, there's some terms in the book that um, rather than you know, like show their definition on the screen, let's just look at a figure and it's identifying them. Um, <clears throat> first of all, there's the, uh, the average daily flow rate during dry weather, which is just uh, the flow rate that you know, half of the amount is going to be lower than that, half the amount is going to be higher than that. So in this particular day, that's shown here. The average dry weather flow rate is 106 cubic meters per day. Um, then there's an instantaneous peak of 187 cubic meters per day. But then if you were to look at during a one hour period, what is the average flow rate during the highest one hour, you can see it's 183 cubic meters per day. Um, I'm not sure where this 13.5 hours comes from, the maximum 13.5 hour sustained flow rate. Uh, I'm not familiar with what that criteria is, but it's just showing you know, the highest flow rate during a certain period of time. Uh, the same thing, a minimum hour and then the minimum instantaneous flow rate. So those are some of the terms that came out of the book. And we've talked about the importance of understanding flow rates is that the wastewater treatment process is not a chemical reaction, it's not strictly a physical reaction, but um, it's a biological reaction that's very hard to start and stop quickly. There are bacteria in a wastewater treatment plant that may take uh, a month or 60 days to get fully established and um, um, if you have a really high flow going through the treatment plant, they can be washed out or if it's a really low flow rate, they can be starved and both of those are important to avoid. All right, so we've talked about quantities. Let's just briefly take a look at constituents before we begin the in-class exercise. Uh, there are some really important main 
water quality parameters that are listed here, and it's showing both um, if you don't have ground up kitchen waste in wastewater, and if you do have a um, food grinder in your, in your sink. I don't have one at my house. I used to. When I was growing up, I always had one, but I don't now. Uh, and obviously, the, the waste quantities are lower if you don't have them than if you do. Now, this is expressing it two different ways. Columns two through four has units of pounds per person per day. And then these last two columns are showing what the concentration of the uh, constituent is in wastewater if you have 50 gallons of wastewater per day being generated. I'm sorry, liters per person per day. Um, and gallons in parentheses. So 140, 190 liters per person per day or 50 versus 100. So if you're using less water, then the BOD strength is higher. You have more concentrated waste if you're using more, uh, more water. I guess it's because the, uh, the water that you're conserving, if you have a lot of conservation efforts, isn't necessarily reducing the amount of uh, food waste or human waste that's getting into the sewer, but it is reducing the volume that would be diluting those things. You know, if, if you're using less water for the shower, less water for the uh, bathing and cleaning and so on. Um, it even goes so far as to identify the amount of oil and grease that's typical in terms of pounds per person per day that's generated uh, for both of those. So let's take a look at a brief calculation example here. Um, the population of Huntington is 49,177. And that is as of, I think that was the 2000 census. And so it may be higher or lower than that now, but that's the population back in 2000. Now let's say that you do have ground up kitchen waste in the wastewater. So you have a garbage disposal. And um, we wanted to know for this population of 49,000, what mass of oxygen is required to uh, treat the wastewater if this BOD5 is reduced by 95%. So remember last week we talked about how even sugar cubes can be a pollutant because if you add the sugar cubes to the river, then it's going to stimulate biological activity that consumes dissolved oxygen. Now, in this case, it's not sugar cubes. Trust me, <laughs> that's in the uh, wastewater. Uh, it's a lot of different things that is causing a downstream demand for oxygen. So if we had uh, BOD5 of 0 0.20 pounds per capita per day, that means 0.2 pounds of BOD5 per person per day is uh, being generated. And you have uh, times 49,177 people. Then that means that going to the wastewater treatment plant in Huntington, on average, would be 9,835.4 pounds of BOD5. In other words, that means you require that many pounds of oxygen in order to break down that waste. Um, for 95% removal, though, if you just have 95% reduction, so 0 0.95 times 9835.4 pounds, then um, 9343.6 pounds of O2 is required each day. So that's just an illustration of how you go from the amount of waste constituent that's generated per person per day to the amount of oxygen that's required. Um, so Huntington Sanitary Board is who operates the wastewater treatment plant in Huntington. Do they have to go to a vendor and purchase oxygen? Do they have like a truck delivering 9,000 pounds of oxygen each day? No? They're not, that's not how it works. Where does that oxygen come from that they are 
that, that's being used. Aeration, right. So that's uh, from aeration. Our atmosphere is only 20% oxygen. So if you think about it, and that's, I think that that's by mass. Nitrogen and oxygen are pretty close, and so mass and volume aren't going to be really different. But um, the point is, if, if you're using about 10,000 pounds of oxygen per day, then that means you're going to be using about 50,000 pounds of air per day. But uh, aeration doesn't have a perfect efficiency, so you have to blow a lot of air through the aeration basin in order to get that 9,000 pounds of oxygen dissolved into the aeration basin, you have to deliver an enormous volume of air into the aeration basin. And so uh, it requires a lot of electricity to do that. Um, one, I think I read somewhere that up to 50% of the cost of treating wastewater is just providing electricity for the aeration basin. It's a very, very expensive step. and so. Um, we'll talk more about that later, but uh, let's look at what about oil and grease? Um, that's usually collected in primary treatment in a wastewater treatment plant where just you've got a, a clarifier that the heavy solids are sinking to the bottom. Whatever floats to the top will be skimmed off the top. If we have... Uh, um, 49,177 people, and we have 0.07 pounds of grease and oil uh, per capita per day, then what that means is each day we're going to generate, well not generate, we're going to collect 3,442.39 pounds of uh, oil and grease. So more than a ton of oil and grease. And if you look at that on a density basis, we can find the volume is going to be the, uh, the mass divided by the density. So 3442.39 pounds of oil and grease. And a typical density for grease and oil would be seven pounds per gallon. So that translates into 491.8 gallons per day of oil and grease being pulled out of the um, being pulled out of the sewer at Huntington Sanitary Board. I, I don't know on an actual basis how much they actually are removing. Um, but it it's kind of interesting if uh, there was an article in a magazine that I read a few months ago that was talking about the oil and grease uh, recovery business and how competitive it really is. Like if you look behind restaurants, they usually have special dumpsters just for grease and they're locked because it's very valuable recycling that grease and uh, turning it into fuel and processing it. Um, grease can be very valuable. So I wonder if Huntington Sanitary Board has some grease hauler who's paying them for that 500 gallons per day. It would be interesting to know more, but I don't. All right. Another one of the tables that is in the book shows how the composition of water changes as it goes from fresh, pure, delicious drinking water and whatever we do to it to turn it into wastewater. And so this is how the, uh, the chemistry of water changes between drinking water and uh, wastewater. It gains a lot of ions. You can see that it's uh, getting additional sulfate. Here is, each one of these is how much it has gained. And so on average, it will gain between 24 and 60 milligrams per liter of chloride. It will gain sulfates. It will get additional calcium, magnesium, and sodium. Um, the uh, the other constituents here, one of the things that's interesting to point out is that the alkalinity is incre increasing. And so that if, uh, if you're doing chemical reactions at a treatment plant, often the alkalinity changes how much of a treatment chemical you'll need. D dissolved solids are going up. So 
Here's the uh, typical concentration of untreated domestic wastewater. And compare that to, I pulled up Huntington's, um, well, I don't know if this is Huntington. What this is, is this is the standards that the state of West Virginia has for what it calls Category 3A municipalities. And it's the strictest standards that it has. And so I'm assuming that it, pl it applies these strictest standards to the, uh, the largest cities. And the, the largest cities in the state are Huntington and uh, Charleston. So you know, if that's true, that they have the strictest standards for the biggest cities, if you look at what comes into the treatment plant, which is this table, so like a typical medium strength BOD, 200 milligrams per liter is what comes into the treatment plant, and the limit of what goes out. So there, the BOD, the five-day BOD, um, the average monthly BOD during the summer, it can only be five milligrams per liter coming out, and during the winter, they can have 10 milligrams per liter going out. Do you happen to know if Huntington is this category 3A? I don't, but I know it's, it's actually, I'm pretty sure it's not dependent on the city. Oh, really? Oh. Well, then maybe the Ohio River isn't as sensitive as a lot of the other ones. Well, there's also factored into that, uh, the control permit to the volume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The permit that I pulled up online didn't show which cities goes with which standard. There were some standards that were as high as, I think, uh, 30 milligrams per liter as the BOD, and it didn't differentiate between summertime and wintertime flows. Um, but what this does give you an idea of is the challenge that's faced at the treatment plant. If what's coming in is 200 milligrams per liter of BOD, and for the suspended solids, 195 milligrams per liter is a typical medium strength waste. And here you can see the suspended solids there, uh, average monthly suspended solids should be at 30. Uh, and you can see that there's also uh, the average monthly during the summer should only be five as an average, but one of the maximum day and the maximum instantaneous can be higher than that. Uh, it's also interesting that for dissolved oxygen, the, the water that enters the river has to have at least six milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen when it leaves the treatment plant. So uh, has to be completely dechlorinated. There can't be any chlorine after disinfecting the wastewater when it's discharged. Um, so we'll come back to this several times during the semester and see uh, how it is a treatment plant is able to achieve these uh, really difficult standards and, and in fact the standards are even more strict depending on how you plan to reuse the water. If it's going to be um, like using wastewater for irrigation as they do in, in, some company, in some countries like I was mentioning in the UAE where I was living, the wastewater that they, um, they treat there they turn around and use for irrigation and um, they have a much stri stricter standard than five milligrams per liter of BOD when they're using it for uh, irrigation later on. Um, this figure is showing the unique wastewater characteristics of a uh, textile mill where wool is being produced and uh, you can have a lot of oxygen demand coming from both um, when there's paper being produced or fabrics being produced. Uh, here is a tomato cannery and the BOD can be very high, uh, over 1,000 milligrams per liter during the peak season at a food processing plant. And I talked about that last week, how in the Central Valley of California, there are some really high discharges at food processing plants. Um, and uh, rainfall, when it gets mixed with uh, sanitary sewage, has this combined wastewater. And so it changes the characteristics of uh, BOD, for example, of a combined wastewater is typically going to be less than for municipal wastewater. So the range of typical BOD concentrations for municipal wastewater that doesn't have the rainwater added to it, uh, you can see is higher than the combined sewage. What I thought was kind of interesting is uh, lead. There's actually 
lead in the rainfall. Um, does anybody know where atmospheric, what's the source of atmospheric lead? You know, because like back in the 70s and the early 80s, there used to be lead in automobile, automobile fuel, um, but that was, it's been a long time since lead was in normal auto fuel. Now we all drive unleaded uh, powered engines. So where is it coming from? Lead smelters, you know, lead is still used as an industrial product, and so there, there are some uh, places where lead is being produced and uh, it's getting into the air there. Um, but airplanes, piston-driven aircraft, still use leaded fuel because at higher elevations, it's more difficult for them to avoid the knocking that lead prevents. So I, I didn't know that until I, I actually Googled that today. You know, like, why would there be lead in, in rainfall? Because I thought that leaded fuel was a thing of the past. But what I can't figure out is why there's BOD in rainfall. I didn't necessarily find an answer to that, why there would be 10, 1 to 13 milligrams per liter of BOD in rainfall. That just doesn't make sense to me. But that's what it says in the table. All right. Um, the last thing we're going to look at today before getting to the in-class exercise is this uh, peaking factor table. And what it shows is that the longer the period is that you're looking at, if you're looking at a 30-day period, then it's less likely for you to have a really high, unusually high flow rate for the longer the period of averaging occurs. And so if it's just a five-day period, then you may have a sustained five-day period where you have maybe double the average flow rate, but the longer the averaging time, the decrease in the peaking factor that you should use. All right, let me give you the in-class exercise. Uh, work this one with someone that you didn't work with last week. I'd like you to uh, work in partners, but with someone new. And what you're going to do here is a planning activity where uh, there is a new residential development being planned, basically a retirement village, but a really, really big one. Uh, there is a town in Arizona that's called uh, Sun City West. It's a planned community that has 15,000 households. And so what you need to do is, uh, as it explains here in the handout, that they're going to be designing something very similar to Sun City West. And we want to know um, how much wastewater they're going to have and what is the mass of BOD, total suspended solids, total killed all nitrogen. That's what TKN stands for, is it's a way of estimating the nitrogen in wastewater, total phosphorus, oil, and grease. So calculate the water that's coming in, the volume of it, and then um, the mass of each of these constituents that's going to have to be treated. In the list of things that I've provided here, like tennis, swimming, fitness center, I just copied that off of the website for Sun City West. And the idea of putting that there is some of these things requires water and is going to generate wastewater, and some of them don't generate wastewater, like the fact that they have a, a county tax assessor representative on site. Obviously, that's not going to generate any additional wastewater, but in the planning process, you have to correlate the amenities that are going to be provided with the amount of wastewater that you have to be prepared to handle. So it's not just 15,000 houses, but it's also the fact that they're going to have three grocery stores there, that they're going to have a bowling alley, that they're going to have fitness centers, and so on. Okay, so I'll stop talking now. We've got about 30 minutes for you to do this planning exercise, just these, uh, the two bullet points that are listed there, and of course I'll be circulating around to answer any questions you might have. I put a couple of tables on the back as well, some of the data that you can use in order to start thinking about um, how they're going to generate wastewater.